was taught at a very young age what racism was, what white supremacy was. Racism is evil. If you are black, you are the help. You are not to be taken seriously. You are a criminal. You are someone who is supposed to shut up and accept what America gives you. Democracy would have to be a utopia, right? It's like this ideal place where everybody's voice counts and it can only be created if we destroyed the systems that that's comprised of America, right? People live under this illusion that they have power that they give to politicians. That's not real power. Real power is in the people when you make the politicians do what you want them to do. America's governed by people who are bought and paid for by the rich. It's the money that makes the decisions, it's not the people. Voting is power, right? Black people don't know how to wield that power. When we fought for the right to vote, when the Honorable Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. put his life on the line, for the right to vote. He was fighting for the power of the vote, the power to change laws, the power of legislation. This is not what he fought for. That's why votes don't have any power. My brother. Come on in, ho. Black man. How's everything? Cool, cool, cool. Okay, come How on, you? have a seat. Thank you, sir. So before we get started, I got to know where you've been and what you've been up to so we can start uh, so, doing um, some things. It's all about black opportunities, right? That's the new organization. I feel like we apex with Black Lives Matter. So um, I filed for my license to carry in Texas, which will carry over to 30 states. Right. We want to be prepared and ready if that violence arises. I will tell you that you may be met with resistance and the quickest way to change the laws regarding upholding your Second Amendment right, which is the right to bear arms, is to have people of color apply for applications to carry a gun in volume. You will see a change in state law because somebody will be tracking that. So I just want you to be aware of it, uh -huh. right? You know, what's okay. really interesting is um, we are seeing record levels of black gun ownership. And we should. And as that happened, there's a shortage of bullets right now. And there's actually a Republican, a hardcore Republican, that was introduced to me by a, a mutual friend that said, I'll help you fight this. So um, he well, just... Well, look, I'm not surprised, because yeah. remember, back his story, history has told us that Republicans was on the right side of the ledger when it came down to slavery, and then went to the other side of the ledger as time went on. So, so I'm not surprised by the category, no. but yeah. you're gonna find a needle in a haystack. You know, what's, you know what's really interesting? So around the 1960s when Dr. King and everything was on fire, right? There was a, 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 a run for the presidency, right? Democrats knew that they needed black vote. So they appeared pro-civil rights. So the Republicans said, we're going after the white Southern vote and that's when everything shifted. Right, right. I really feel as though black folks don't have anyone fighting for them in politics. You see your hands. When Martin Luther King Jr. was murdered, there was an uproar across the world, right? There were riots all over this country. Put your hands up right now. Let me see your other hand. People really cared. Just like when George Floyd was killed. Oh, what do you want? I can't breathe. Please, the name of it. I can't breathe, sir. George, George Floyd was just a regular dude. He was no freedom fighter. He was no angel that God sent down to give us the right to vote. He was just a regular dude. 
but the way that he he was killed, it jolted everybody into action. We look back at the protests spurred um, by the Black Lives Matter movement, and we see this as a turning point in American democracy and in democracy more generally. It wasn't the death of George Floyd alone that sparked the massive protests that we saw in the United States in 2020. It was that death on top of a long-term process of disenfranchisement and disillusionment on the part of African American and other citizens that really caused that explosion. What I think a lot of people felt was we're not gonna take it anymore. Uh, just a collective feeling of enough is enough. The racial wounds and divisions that still have not healed in the United States, still have not been transcended in the United States. And it didn't end with the civil rights legislation of the 60s, and it didn't end with the election of an African-American president. I think that in order to get rid of the racial divides in this country is going to take a lot of hard work and it's going to be complicated. I don't think that it's going to be a simple process. It's not easy to change and the longer you've been doing something, the even harder that it is to change. And this has been the status quo for the Western world since slavery began. We have defined what it means to be a human being. We have defined what it means to be a citizen based on race. I think that people have trouble believing in democracy because we don't have a good example. It's hard to believe in what you can't see. It's even harder to conceptualize something new. And so people are just looking for answers. And I think that is really the, that's really the conversations that are happening around the world. I don't think that um, addressing the race problem will solve, will s allow us to achieve democracy. But I think that it is, a necessary first step. I think that racism is a huge issue and extremely influential. And I think that's where I always start. I am not coming to you asking you to stop being racist as a person who is devoid of prejudice. But you have to learn how to question why. Why do I think that something different from the, what I've seen is wrong? When we talk about the majority of America not believing in democracy, how would most of them define it? How would most of them define our own democracy? Why don't we care about other people enough to allow them the same opportunities we would want for ourselves? But will that water become in that man a living fountain of water springing up unto everlasting life? So I think we can see the consequences of very deep social divisions and cleavages in the United States where we now have one party, a Republican party, that has become in many ways extremely homogenous. It is overwhelmingly white. It is overwhelmingly not just Christian, but composed of people who are quite religious. But God gave me a dream about President Trump in the White House, and he said, I want you to start praying for this man. The Democratic Party in this country is composed of people from a broader array of backgrounds, except for those types of folks who are represented in the Republican Party. And so people have really retreated into seeing themselves as parts of groups that are really quite distinct that don't have a lot of overlap or interaction with other groups. And therefore, the sense that we are Americans in addition to all of these other identities. If you don't believe in Antifa, you're a fascist! Antifa people that came to shut down the Antifa worship. never killed anyone! What makes out that? Antifa infiltrated. They had plans to dress up and look like Trump supporters. They sent. I've never seen the United States so divided 
in the political agendas that people have. And it's a very serious problem to many of us. We like to focus on why are people violating our laws, and in particular, the Constitution of the United States. This division in our society has been boiling for a long time. It's not that Trump all of a sudden brought this division on. It's the fact that they now have a strong, strong Republican who has been able to move things that they want to just blame him for everything that has gone wrong. All the people have a right to vote. My personal opinion is when you're part of any country, you need to understand there are responsibilities. It's not all about rights that belong to us. We have elections that are supposed to be run a certain way. One of the major problems with the current situation is that the people in power worked to make sure that more ballots were put in, votes for that particular candidate than the other candidate. And so would that be considered fraud? Yes. You hear many stories. I cannot justify whether the stories are true or they're false. You look at their death records and people who have been dead for years are voting. How can that be? There is, I think, um, a real division uh, that is reflected in values, you know, attitudes towards religion, towards, uh, you know, certain social practices that I think is, you know, actually shaping a lot of contemporary politics. What is the problem? Why does identity uh, pose such, a, such an enduring and serious challenge for democracy? Dankwart Rustow wrote this famous article back in the 1960s which said that one of the basic requirements of a democracy is you have to believe you're living in the same country. Well, actually, what was interesting about that article is he said it's the only precondition <laughs> is a common sense of national identity. Everything else you can develop along the way. Uh, the trouble for democratic politics comes when your identity becomes essentialized, meaning it's the most important thing about you. So difficult to actually govern them because they have no sense of national identity. So this is clearly the single most emotive dividing line in American politics now. I, I have no doubt of this. Do you have any thoughts about how this can be bridged? I think there is a kind of unfortunate tendency that you know, a lot of people want everybody to think the way they do, and their strategies are all about how do we actually homogenize everybody in terms of thought. But I just think that, you know, the challenge of living in a diverse society is precisely, you know, figuring out how to, how to get along with people that don't agree with you. I think we did not fully understand how very fragile our democracy was and how very divided our society was. Our democracy is extremely fragile and that if we are not constantly cultivating and protecting its foundations, they can erode with really surprising rapidity. And that the divisions in our society, if we do not figure out ways to overcome them, then the door will be open for another illiberal autocratic figure like Trump to walk through and begin this process of attacking American democracy and American community again. Hey, 
This is what we call mutual aid. This is us taking care of us. We don't need nobody else but our community to make sure that our community is straight. We got free food, courtesy of Black Lives Matter New York. This is organizing. This is the community. It's a lot more than marching down the street. It's us taking care of us. Us organizing us. You want to put help put it in the bag? You got it? We need strong black communities. I have a dream that is economic separation because nobody will care about what black people are talking about until we remove our money from their systems and use that money to build up schools and our communities. We can build our own communities where we don't have to rely on white people. All free food, coming back. Come on, ma'am, it's all right. You can come and get a bag, it's all free food. We don't have to rely on their money, on their business. Just imagine, they're black banks. Just imagine. If they stopped shopping at all their stores and started shopping at our stores, you know how fast we would get rights? I don't, I don't, I don't have to stand hand in hand with white people and sing songs and be happy. I just have to live a life without the obstruction of oppression. So when we say Black Lives Matter, essentially is saying that your life doesn't matter, our life does matter. And, and they get upset if you say all lives matter because they want to focus on Black. The Black Lives Matter created more havoc and more, more violence than peace. They were not a peaceful organization. As a brown person myself, I'm ashamed of them. They don't stand for what we stand for. Identity is difficult for democracy. So you see yourself primarily as a member of a particular ethnic group or a particular religious group or identify most with a sexual minority. Um, and these are things that obviously are not problematic in themselves. They only become problematic when they're seen as being in competition with or antithetical to broader national identities. There are some very real problems in our society, some very deep social divisions that if we do not recognize and deal with, our democracies and our societies are going to continue to decay. I hope that we never see a gunshot here against another American from a American to American. I hope it never happens. I see both sides are uh, getting more passionate, more intense. And we're not looking at us as American citizens. We're looking at that's the right, that's the left, and that's it. And there's a big river or a big mountain in between us, and we can't come together. I, I think that it's possible in the next 10 years that uh, something could happen in, in, in terms of a civil war. It's like a volcano. Volcano just doesn't erupt all of a sudden. It builds pressure, and then eventually it erupts. We're building that pressure because we are not going according to the fundamental principles of the Constitution. Hey, 
Here you go, boy. God bless you. All right, you stay warm out there. All right. T. Brinkley. The law is white. It benefits white people and it decimates black people. It rips apart our homes. It locks us in cages. It chokes us to death. It puts bullets through our bodies. That's what the law does to us. And that's when we were out there tearing things apart. Why America handles its problems violently or with the threat of violence. So why wouldn't, why wouldn't we do that? What do we do about that? Are we going to have, and I'll say the word, a civil war? Are we going to fight among ourselves? is in a more and more perilous state. My biggest fear is about democracy in the West. If we don't defend and renew and reform, invigorate democracy in, in our democracies, we're not going to be an example that is inspiring to other countries in the world. But I remain an optimist. I think there is a new generation emerging that is seeking uh, a multiracial society uh, in which everybody can live in dignity. I don't think that we'll ever be able to completely eradicate um, inequalities or human suffering. I guess what democracy looks like in practical terms is an intention and is a consistent effort to achieving that ideal. I do this for the voiceless who don't have a lot of choices. I don't think that that's something that will ever not exist, but I think that being willing to do the work to minimize it, to help people, to care about people. That is what matters. But if we stop trying, then we have no business calling ourselves a democracy. There are many paradoxes surrounding democracy. And one paradox is the divergent tendencies in human nature. We all want to be respected. We all want to be treated with dignity. We'd all like to have some power and control over our own lives. But at the same time, there is this darker side of human nature, the greed for power, the greed for wealth, insecurity, the drive to monopoly, the drive to tyranny, and the vanity that comes 
through tyrants who want to dominate uh, over their citizens and control all sources of information, wealth, and power. So this is the stuff of human history. This is the struggle uh, of politics.